You will hear part of a lecture about studying history. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin this term's lectures with a discussion of the various subdisciplines in history. Before I do that, though, can I refer you to the handout you picked up on the way in? It deals with two general topics. The first is why study history, and the second is. What is history? Neither of these questions has an easy answer. In fact, people have been asking these questions for as long as history has been studied. However, as you are mostly new students to this subject, and we have some students of economics with us also, I feel you should have some background to these basic questions. Anyway, it's all in the handout. I might add that for me personally, the most important reason for studying history. Is that I find it exciting. Our ancestors can remain, if we want them to, a mystery, a closed book, a blackness that we never see into, or we can come to know what motivated them and discover how that led to the world we live in today. Now answer questions four to ten. You who have chosen to pursue the study of history are very fortunate. This is a time when we can talk not just about history but histories. Traditionally, history was seen as one subject, and the subject matter was clear. It was about kings and queens and wars. Additionally, it was about states and empires or groups of states. This is what we now call political history. The subtopics were the parts of the world, for example, the history of China or of France. History has moved on somewhat, and we can learn a lot about current views of history by looking at the proposed lecture topics in our leading universities. In fact, you'll see that even the simplest definition of history, that it is about what happened in the past, is up for grabs. Some of the more How shall I put it? Progressive areas of study are as much about what should happen in the future. One example of this is the field of postmodern history. Likewise, feminist history looks at the past to make sure the future will be different, and it uses the past to assist in its efforts to make the future as it wants it to be. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lie a range of areas of study which have developed over the modern period, replacing the traditional idea of political history. These are by now mostly well established. You can study social history or economic history. Social history asks about the ordinary people and their lives, not just their daily lives, but their contribution to changes in our society. Ordinary people have desires and wishes which they try to put into effect, and this has a massive effect on social development, which was not fully understood in the traditional study of history. By the way, one area of traditional history which I forgot to mention, but which has had a resurgence of interest in recent years, is the area of military history. This was, of course, of great practical use in more violent times. And unfortunately, has become of increasing use and interest academically and practically in our own times. By the way, there is a new series of lectures on military history in our department, as if to demonstrate the truth of what I've just said. Ethnic and multicultural history are further examples of kinds of history which, like social history, differ from the traditional forms. Ethnic history is a modern concern which concentrates on the value systems and beliefs of a people, usually a minority people, which were ignored in the rapid forward march of the rich and powerful nations and states. How various ethnic groups live together and how their traditions change and develop is the subject of its contemporary cousin, multicultural history. In sum. As I said, you are fortunate to have such a wide choice of things to study in the fields of history. Choose wisely, and finally, it only remains for me to wish you good luck in your studies.
Listening section two. You will hear the principal of a university welcoming his students. Look at questions eleven to seventeen. Listen to the first part of the lecture and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Donovan, the principal of Don Levy University, and I would like to welcome you to the Dinglewood campus, which is one of the three campuses belonging to this university. This campus, Dinglewood, is where I have my office. And it's also the location of the languages and science campus, so some of you will be studying here. Dinglewood is the most northerly campus. The business studies blocks are in the Churchdown campus, in the centre of town, and the Southern or Trailway campus, where history and architecture are situated, is to the south of the town. Those of you who are enrolled in any of those courses will be taken to your respective buildings at the end of this meeting. Those of you studying on the Dinglewood campus, you will have a tour later too. This building we are assembled in is the office or administration block, block thirty-nine, and is where the weekly meetings are held. You are welcome to attend these meetings, as are all the university staff. You may want to, as many university issues are discussed at these weekly meetings. The meetings take place at one thirty every Tuesday, so please stop by. Two other important buildings are also located on this campus: the cafeteria and the on-site shop. You can purchase all the required books and any stationery you need for your courses at this shop. Please bear in mind that even though you have shown your ID passes to enter the site, you still need to use them again to buy anything in the shop or cafeteria. This is for security reasons. Now look at questions eighteen to twenty. As the lecture continues, answer questions eighteen to twenty. Now, if I could draw your attention to the back page of your joining instructions booklet, you will see a small map of this campus, Dingle Wood. The block we are in now, the office and administration block, is located between the languages centre, block thirty-eight. And the physics school, block thirty, that's three O. These are both on the right of the plan. The cafeteria, which is open from seven a.m. to nine thirty p.m., is on the left of the plan. It is between the chemistry block, number thirty-five, and the university shop, block thirty-three. At the university shop. You can get all you will need in terms of course materials. The biology block is block number twenty-nine, and you'll find the biology block between the chemistry block and the languages centre. Be careful with the numbers, as they are not always logical. As you will see, 
There are gardens on the right-hand side of the gate. These are being extended over the next two months, and a memorial fountain is being installed in the middle of the campus. This means that the campus will be very noisy during normal working hours. However, the campus will look much nicer when it is all finished. Right. So that's it for your initial campus orientation. At this point, could the language students all follow me, please? And the rest of you, please assemble under the banners which show your main topic of study. And you will be directed to the other campuses. Test one, section three. John has applied to train as a teacher, and is being interviewed. In this stage of the interview, the interviewer will discuss John's previous studies and work experiences. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hello, uh, come in and take a seat. <laughs> you are、uh, John Evans. Yes, I am. Well,、uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the purpose of this part of the interview is to go over your CV and talk a little further about your previous studies and experiences. Yes. So your first degree was in French, of course. Yes, with a minor in film studies. Hmm, an interesting combination. Mostly French films, presumably. Well, European cinema in general, but with a bias towards French cinema. Ah, and your degree took four years. Yes, in the third year I was an exchange student at Bruges University in Belgium. Ah, I was there for a full academic year, nine months. Hmm, right. Well, you graduated two years ago, and then you、uh, you took some time out, as it were. Yes, I spent six months as a volunteer working on restoring historic buildings in France. Oh, was that with a well-known organisation? They're called Restoration Vacations here, but they operate under different names in several countries. I think they're quite well known. Hmm. So、uh, it was a six-month vacation, really. No, I went for a week, but really liked it, and I got asked to stay on as a translator、yeah. because I could speak French quite well. It was my job to liaise between the owners of the buildings and the English-speaking volunteers.、Hmm. That must have been a very enjoyable experience. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen, and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Well, it was certainly a very enjoyable experience to begin with, but after the first three months or so, I actually got a bit bored.、Oh. I was talking about the same things every day: bricks, cement, window frames, that kind of thing. It wasn't really stretching my French. Also, I wasn't getting paid; just free accommodation and food. Plus some pocket money. Ah,、oh, I see. So then you started working for a bank in Paris,、um, uh, uh, BCFC, I think.、Uh, ah, yes. Were you doing entirely translating again? Well, translating was the major part of it, mostly from English into French this time. Official documents, letters, that kind of thing. Much more challenging. 
but I was also in charge of coordinating the translation work going on in the bank's offices in Switzerland, Belgium, and other parts of France. Huh. What did that involve? It was simple, really. I just had to keep track of what had been translated in each office. To save wasting time having the same document translated twice in different offices. So,、uh, you stayed there for a year and a half and then you left.、Uh, why was that? Simple, to apply for this course. I see. Why give up a secure job in Paris to train as a teacher here? I've always imagined that I'd be a teacher, really. I loved being in Paris, but I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life working for a bank.、Ah. Do you think your experiences in France will help you as a teacher of French? It certainly helped my French, and my experiences certainly gave me a much better understanding of French culture.、Mm. Although that may not be of enormous use when it comes to standing up in front of a class of British 13 year olds. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs>、uh, well,、uh, thank you very much. The next stage of the interview will be conducted by my colleague in room 207. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the Environmental Studies Department on Agriculture and Environment. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this lecture on agriculture and the environment. I hope it is enough to make some of you decide on a career in the field of agricultural science. As you all know, food is a basic human need, and producing enough of it is the single greatest challenge facing the modern world. Developing nations have rapidly expanding populations, so agriculture should be central to any development agenda for those countries. What's more, 75% of people in the developing world are dependent, directly or indirectly, on agriculture for their livelihood. And for many low-income countries, it's the most important sector of the economy, accounting for 50% of GDP. And sometimes it's the primary, if not only, source of foreign currency. Now, of course, when I talk about agriculture, I am using the term to encompass more than just growing food crops. Of course, livestock farming, fishing, and forestry are included. In order to combat wide-scale food shortages, agricultural research programs are underway in many areas. Using science is one way to increase productivity, but a word of warning: agriculture must also be sustainable. Let's look at approaches that are not sustainable. Firstly, overgrazing and intensive cropping are two ancient but destructive practices that lead to loss of soil fertility. Secondly, the modern idea of liberal application of chemical pesticides and herbicides. Has had disastrous consequences for the health of the land, ranging from the pollution of water sources to the destruction of wildlife. These practices have ignored the mechanisms that sustain ecological communities. Ignorance has led to the destruction of the very biodiversity that is essential for sustainable food production. However, introducing new agricultural techniques. Especially things like genetic engineering 
can be difficult because many people remain suspicious of the fact that plants have had their genetic material modified by scientists. Biotechnology has also led to the dubious practice of bioprospecting, or, as some prefer to call it, biopiracy. Foreign multinational companies have been accused of illegally obtaining samples of indigenous plants of other countries in order to get their hands on genetic material to improve the quality or yield of their own crops. We must put aside the controversy surrounding the field of agricultural biotechnology in order to concentrate on the biggest threat to food production on this planet, which is, yes, climate change. The effects of global warming so far have been to shrink the food supply, thereby pushing up prices and making even the most basic necessities unaffordable. As I see it, the international community must address this and other challenges to agricultural production with urgency. Concrete scientific and technological achievements need to be presented for farmers to evaluate and learn to use, but apart from that, governments need to address the complex issues of policy development if the world's hungry are to be fed. Environmental policies need to be put in place to protect ecosystems and correct soil degradation where possible. Countries cannot continue to exploit natural resources whilst ignoring the consequences. In fact, I'd like to see teams of agriculture and environment experts making up a global network which would monitor the world's farming systems. Different farming systems should be studied not only with a view to analyzing the environmental effects, but the social and economic effects as well. The studies would be carried out with a view to stemming pollution and erosion and promoting safe, cost-effective practices that will guarantee a secure food supply in the future. Monitoring sites would need to be set up all across the world and data collected in a systematic way. Of course, building the online infrastructure for such a project would cost millions of dollars, and there would be ongoing costs involved with the monitoring system. But the information gathered would go a long way towards solving the problem of feeding the masses and ensuring millions of people don't face a hungry future. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.